Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're here today for Sabbath School. Choose Life, lesson number eight. Today we have Barbara and Hi. Mark teaching as well. And before we open up and start today's lesson, Mark, if you could open us in prayer so the Holy Spirit, the most important part, can be present. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Dear Lord, you know, we are, we thank you for this time that we can get together and dig into your word, um, this word about life. And help be with each of us, help be with our audience, help us to learn from you, directly from you. I'm excited to hear what my brothers and sisters are going to say, my fellow members here. I'm excited to share your message that you've uh, shared in these books and, and, and help us in each one of us to receive it, to internalize it, and share it with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so our memory verse for today is Deuteronomy 30.19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live and you are you and your descendants. Oh, this is, we're going to touch on a lot of this today. But, but let's start off by, we all make choices in our lives, right? At least hundreds of them every single day. Things like what we want to wear, what we're going to eat for breakfast are pretty normal and quite honestly mundane, right? How about something about um, choices on moving to a different city or a career change? Or even say someone who's caring for an elderly parent and what's best for them? A little more difficult. Now, some of these choices though truly do have life and death consequences. Now, and you say, wait, but some of these can be harder. Now let me give you the bulletproof example. If I, offer, if I gave you the choice of receiving multiple gunshot wounds to your body or a thousand dollar shopping spree to the mall, which one would you choose? Shopping. I don't know anyone in their right mind who would not choose the shopping spree. So we can see that you know, that choice is pretty easy and yet when we have decisions about choosing life in God's way, it gets a little more complicated. So we're going to look at three themes today in today's lesson. Um, first of all is the great controversy and the first choice that was made not for life. The second is about the requirement of choice. Now, uh, there is no bowing out or abstentions here. You choose one or the other. Even if you consciously choose nothing, you've still chosen something. <clears throat> And we're going to look at number three, what is at stake for us not only to have life and to have it abundantly, as Scripture says, in this world, but eternal life with God in the next. Or, if you choose otherwise, misery and death eternal. So let's start off by looking at the great controversy, number one. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 1, page 39, Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. He saw that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. That's Psalms 145, 17. That the divine statutes are just, are just and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. Had he done this, he might have saved himself and many angels he had not at that time fully cast off his allegiance to God. Though he had left his position as covering cherub, yet if he had been willing to return to God, acknowledging the Creator's wisdom, and satisfied to fill the place appointed him in God's great plan, he would have been reinstated in his office. The time had come for a final decision. He must fully <laughs> yield to the divine sovereignty... I bolded that because that's so important, or place himself in open rebellion. Sound familiar to anyone? It does for me. He nearly reached the decision to return, but pride forbade him. It was too great a sacrifice for one who had been so highly honored to confess that he had been in error, that his mingling or Im imaginings were false and to yield to the authority which 
he had been working to prove unjust. Oof. So we look at this, because Lucifer was created perfect. Ezekiel 28, 15 says, You are blameless in your ways from the day that you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And we see the unrighteousness was found in Lucifer, and the ultimate sin was pride, which prevented him from repenting and coming back to God. We know how Eve was, that's one example. We know how Eve was deceived, right? Because Genesis 3.13 says, Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And if you read chapter 3 in Patriarchs and Prophets, it expands on that greatly. So one of the things that can cause a stumbling block for us is pride or stubbornness, stiff-neckedness per se. Another is just being flat-out deceived and not knowing the truth. And another would be Adam from Patriarchs and Prophets, Chapter 3, page 56. Adam understood that his companion had transgressed the command of God, and that would be Eve. Disregarded the only prohibition laid upon them as a test of their fidelity and love. There was a terrible struggle in his mind. He mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side, but now the deed was done. He must be separated from her whose society had been his joy. How could he have it thus? Adam had enjoyed the companionship of God and of holy angels. He had looked upon the glory of the Creator. He understood the high destiny open to the human race should they remain faithful to God. Yet all these blessings were lost sight, or were lost sight of in the fear of losing that one gift which in his eyes outvalued every other. I can't believe that part, but which outvalued every other, including God. Love, gratitude, loyalty to the Creator, all were overborne by love to Eve. He resolved to share her fate. If she must die, he would die with her. And we can see an Adam consciously choosing Eve over God. We can see that God's ways are just by what we've read, true and righteous. But we also see how pride, deception, and, one, and from one another of the world, I'm sorry, deception of from one another in the world, and the love of someone or something can lead us even today to choose death, even if we don't realize it right away. For the second theme, we look at Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So right away, we know that if we do not choose God, we're already done for. If we haven't made a choice, we, we've already transgressed his law, the choice has been made. So we look at the third, and I know we're going to expand on that greatly later. The third is really what is at stake. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, when Paul's writing about the third heaven, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to seek. And there's numerous script, um, scriptures in the Bible about how wonderful heaven is, but I don't think we have any idea what we're really missing out on. I don't think we even have a clue what we are forfeiting by making the choices in this world that we do. Because nothing in this world can hold a candle to what heaven has. Even the best is considered rubbish in heaven. So I honestly believe why so many times we don't choose life is because we are truly clueless. But on that note, as I give the intro to the lesson, Barbara, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, the tree of life and the choice that was made there? Yes, we're going to talk about that choice. Now, Byron talked about how we make 
so many choices on a daily basis and making choices for good or for evil, but there are some choices that we don't make, that we're not able to make. We're not able, um, <clears throat> I don't know that you were asked to be born, you didn't get to choose your parents, but God does give us the ability to choose eternal life through him because of his death on the cross. So let's go back and look at how this all started. And we're going to be reading some excerpts from uh, Genesis 2 and 3, starting with verse 8. The Lord planted a tree in the garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, <clears throat> and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I've always thought about why two trees, and I think because of the outcome is why the two trees. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. And verse 17, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And I've always found this interesting because when God told Adam and Eve that, I don't think they had any comprehension of what death could even mean. They were... Um, created, the garden was beautiful, it was so full of life. I don't, I don't think they understood that until after sin. But in Genesis um, 3 then, 22 and 23, so um, here's what happens. Then the Lord said, Behold, man has become like one of us to know good and evil, because they did eat of that, that fruit. Now lest he put his hand and also take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the God sent, God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And Ellen White has uh, an interesting excerpt, and it's in your lesson, but I think it's worth us reading. In the midst of Eden grew the tree of life whose fruit had power of perpetuating life. Had Adam remained obedient to God, he would have continued to enjoy free access to the tree and would have lived forever. But when he sinned, he was cut off from partaking of that tree of life and became subject to death. The divine sentence, dust thou art and to dust thou return, um, points to the utter extinction of life. So here, Adam and Eve made their choice, didn't they? And the choice they made had brought death to not only them, but to the entire world. So right from the start, the Bible presents us with one or two options, eternal life or eternal death, which in a sense is merely going back to nothingness out of which we first came. It's also interesting, too, how the tree of life gives immortality and that it first appear, appears in the first book of the Bible, but it also appears in the last book of the Bible. So in the beginning, we're both trees, and then at the end, let's look at Revelation 2.22. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So we'll see this tree of life again, if we choose life. So the, perhaps the message is that though we were supposed to have access to the tree of life because of sin, we lost that access. Then at the end, once the sin problem is eliminated, then we will have... Um, an opportunity to eat from that tree again if we choose Jesus. So think about it. Our daily choices, and if you think about how many choices you make in a day, 
to choose, how many you choose, how many of those are you choosing for life or death? How many of those are, choosing, are you choosing to enhance your character or to destroy your character? And that's why we go back, it takes us back to, to Deuteronomy 30, 19, which says, I have called heaven and earth as a witness today against you, that I have set before you life, death, blessings, cursing. Choose life. I think about what that choosing life means, and I think of Joshua in 24, 15, where he says, and if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, Choose your day, this day whom you will serve. Whether it's the gods which your father served on the other side of the river, river or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you dwell. And he said, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Ellen White, <clears throat> I want to finish this by sharing a quote from Steps to Christ, says, many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God. And she does this when she's talking about our choices. You desire to give yourself to him, but you're weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by habits of your, lo your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. And man, have I been there. I have all the best intentions, but so many failures. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, or your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own security and causes you to feel that God can accept you. But you need not despair. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision of choice, Everything depends on right action of the will. Power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You can't, um, of yourself, give to God its affections. But you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under control of the spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts in harmony with him. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Amen. So, we went over no, that's fine. the tree of life. Uh, yes. <laughs> and actually, I'm going to cover in my lesson about what some of those motivations are when you do transgress, but Mark, can you tell us about Monday's lesson? No middle ground. That's right. I mean, we and I think it's, it's clear, I mean, we've already talked, uh, Barbara and, and Byron have already touched on this, this choice, this choice to choose God or not. And, and we're going to dig a little bit, in, and not in my day, but a little bit later, we're going to dig into Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is all about Moses instructed the, instructing the children of Israel, Israel to choose God. And, but he, but, and, that's a, and that's a great thing. And, but as he does that, and we, we learn, we're going to learn about all that power that's there, let's dig into the details about how we can be saved. And as, as we mentioned in the, the title, there's no middle ground. Salvation is really black and white. You know, and God has given us, and we're going to learn about this, of course, he's given us the freedom to choose which path we take. But we're going to talk about it. We're actually not free. We're free to choose, but not free. Let's talk about that a little bit further. But let's go into this, and let's go into the Bible, and let's go to look at outside of Deuteronomy, let's elsewhere in the Bible, and look in scriptures about how simple this choice is. Black and white, no middle ground. Let's go to John chapter 3, verses 16. For the God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life course, there's only one God, and our job is to know him. And then we'll go into Genesis at the very beginning and talk about Noah. Uh, Genesis 7, verses, chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. In whose nostrils, with the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on dry land died. So he destroyed all the living things that were on the face of the ground, both men and cattle, 
creepy things and bird of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained. We know that story. We know that by following God, you will live. That's one more example um, that we know. Let's also read a couple other ones. Romans 8, chapter 8, verses 6. To be carnally not minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Over and over we see this. Also in John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. He who has the Son of Life, he who does not have the Son, who, he, I'm sorry, he who has the Son has life, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Over and over, simple choice. In there, is there a middle ground there? Nope. It's Switch just one is either way on or off. It's There's no off. third one. <laughs> Seems pretty straightforward, right? Matthew had a, um, Jesus had a nice particle in Matthew, verses 22, 24 and 27, okay, where he says, Therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who has built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and, all, and it all did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be a foolish man who built his ha house on sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. My wife and I were discussing this choice, and whether you follow God and live or don't follow God and die. And, and, and really, the reality is it doesn't seem like a choice at all. <laughs> There's only one path, right? Why would you do anything else? And um, it's really that simple. Follow God. Paul puts it very nicely in Romans uh, chapter 16 where he actually talks about the idea of freedom. He says that we really are not free. Every one of us is the slave to something. And look at Romans chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. And we'll read about what Paul says here. Do you not know that whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves which you obey, whether of the sin of leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God, be thanked that though we were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart, um, that form of doctrine in which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became a slave of righteousness. Kind of a neat idea. We each have to obey something. Do you want to obey sin, or do you want to obey righteousness? And let's read what he, he includes here in Romans, 22, uh, Romans 6, verses 20 and 22. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But fruit did... But what fruit did you have in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, of course this was Jesus Christ on the cross, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit of holiness and the end everlasting life. In the end, the choice is still ours, whether you follow God or not. The good news is that God has really set it up for us to have this everlasting life. He chose us to have this covenant with us. He died on the cross, not only to fulfill that covenant, but fulfill, forgive the sins of the world. We are just asked to obey him and love him. What do you want to be a slave of? Let's be slaves of God, and we're going to dig into that further in this lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So now we're going to move on to Tuesday. Life and good, death and evil, blessings and curses. Oh boy, so much. So we're going to read Deuteronomy 30, um, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, or literally good is the word, and death and adversity, or literally the word is evil in Hebrew, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land that you're entering to possess. So, verse 17. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but 
are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and to possess it. I call heaven and earth, and here's our memory verse, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have, uh, that I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God and obeying his voice and by holding fast to him. Or another word for that would be abiding in him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. So in the covenant structure in Deuteronomy, um, the part that follows the blessings and curses, which is in Deuteronomy 27 and 28, after the stipulations in Deuteronomy 5 through 26, culminates in the, in the section of an appeal. God has reminded the Israelites of what, he has di what he's done, all the acts of salvation since their exit in Egypt. He has then moved to the next step, and that's the requirements of Israel. Obedience to the laws and commitment to the covenant. And I love verse 15. We've discussed, you only have two choices, life or death. $1,000 shopping spree at the mall or multiple bullet wounds. So, pretty much. And yet, what do we choose? And so, yes, it's we easy. do. And, it's easy. Shopping. and we're going to understand why we choose the bullets. So we see that in verse 15. Now in verse 16, we see the jo choice that God wants us to make, our part of the covenant, and how we are supposed to get there. It says, love the Lord your God. First of all, how do we love God? 1 John 4, verses 10 and 19 says, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In verse 19, we love because he loved us first. How are we even capable of having a love that God expects from us? Well, we read Matthew 19, 25, and 26. Now, this is when Jesus tells the parable about the rich man. And the, is to get to heaven, you have to go through the eye of the, a camel to go through the eye of the needle. When his disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And it is that abiding and that communion with God that shows us how to love, both to God and to others. It is only possible with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If we love God with all of our hearts, and with all of our souls, and with all of our strength, and we've heard this verse before, right? And choose him as righteousness in him, these commandments and statutes and judgments will all be in perfect alignment with our character. In verse 17 and 18, he talks about the adverse effect of breaking the covenant and not choosing life. And in verse 17, it says, do we, do we worship other gods today? It says to worship other gods and serve them, right? Okay, so we see that in Bali and Thailand. I've witnessed it firsthand. I know in India, but in America, not so much. So what is our gods today in our modern society? Let's put it this way. Anything that we put before God Amen. is an idol. Amen. It is a God that you worship. And yes, that includes ourselves. It includes me, Barbara, or Mark. Luke 14, 26 and 7 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And I look at this verse, and you could almost substitute the cannot be my disciple with cannot have life and good and blessings in Christ Jesus. It's that serious. Don't get me wrong. People are supposed to love their children and their spouse and their parents. That's not what it's really saying. What it is saying is that 
Do you love them so much? Have they become such a focus in your life that they become a stumbling block for God? And it's not just people. It could be power or money or many things. We look at Revelation 5 or Revelation 3, 15 through 17. The Laodicean church. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out, literally the word is vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and I have become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The Laodicean church has no idea of their spiritual condition. So, is there a, a possibility that we might not realize our true spiritual condition? What is it in the world that presents itself to us as a stumbling block to God? And we see in verse 19 the parallel of the treaties and the cultures of the time um, where there was a witness called. And we see the two witnesses, heaven and earth. But God's witnesses are creation themselves. It's only fitting since it is a covenant with God. And then we look at verses 19 and 20. God so desires that we choose life in him. Because it is the only true life anyway. We know that since Adam was made the wrong choice, and he chose Eve over God, that we are all tainted by the tendency to sin. It's literally in our DNA. Paul calls it carnal flesh, or in Romans 7, 14 through 25, we don't have time to read it, but it clearly points out that that carnal flesh and the battle that goes on between the Spirit of God and our fleshly desires. So how can we be faithful to God? Only by surrendering our lives to Christ Jesus. He is the only one who can teach us that love. He is the only one who can show us how to truly love him. And the only begotten of the Father is the one who will guide us there. So, do you fail? Do I fail? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Backslide? Of course. Fall short of the mark every day of my life? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can say more than likely yes. We repent and God lifts us back up and keeps us on the path to him. You think of the law as kind of guardrails on the highway. They warn you when you're going to veer off the path of salvation. They're not going to save you because people go through them all the time, but they keep you on track. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So I have to ask you, are you spending time with God every day? In his word, in prayer, in devotionals, what are you beholding? And if you are doing that, you're being transformed into the same image. If you're not, you're being transformed into a life of misery and death. So, if you're not seeking the life that God has offered and, and offers you so freely and planned for you, why not? What's holding you back? Because remember, God wants everyone to be saved. Barbara, can you tell us about Wednesday? Not too hard for you. I know, it's not too hard for you. That's the good news. Thank God. Now, <laughs> we're going to spend time in Deuteronomy 30 um, to begin with, but we need to look at the context of what's going on here in Deuteronomy 30, and that is Moses' time in life is just about complete. And these are kind of his, these, not a kind of, but these are his last words to the people. These are his final words and his final thoughts and his final encouragement. So I don't want you to think about this being Moses' words to the children of Israel, but these are Moses' words to us as well. So let's jump in and look at Deuteronomy 30. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you 
the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God drives you. And you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. This so easily could be talking to each of us, huh? That the Lord your God may bring you back from captivity on this earth and have compassion for you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out of the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. And we know that that will happen today. God has his people scattered all over this earth. And when he comes, he's going to gather all of us together for him. Then the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. Ye will prosper you. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to the love to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all that you may live. So why, why do we need our hearts circumcised? Maybe because we need to have our hearts pure for God and that there's nothing in our hearts between us and him. So when we circumcise, we remove all that that is away uh, from our hearts. Also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies, on those who hate you and who persecute you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in the work of your hand and in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock or your stock portfolio, and the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of your Lord, your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which is written in the book of the law, and if you turn your, to your God with all your heart, with all your mind and soul. So we need to do that as well today. It's important as we're getting ready to enter the promised land that we take upon ourselves the same counsel that Moses gave his people. So, and then we can go on also to Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. So it isn't a mystery, and it's not too hard. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend <clears throat> to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you may do it. So we see that, that it isn't too hard, that the word of God is, is um, very accessible to us now. I, I, I don't know how many homes have several Bibles, but our, my, mine does. And so we, the, the Word of God is everywhere. If it's, we don't have it in our home, we can get it online. We, we just have total access to it now. The Lord is not asking them to do anything. This is from Christ Objects Lessons. The Lord is not asking them or us to do anything too hard God's command is not too difficult or mysterious for them to understand, nor is it too far out of reach for them to attain. It is not way up in heaven, so far away, that someone else has to get it from them, nor is it across the seas, so someone else might bring it to them. Instead, the Lord says, but the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. That is you know it well enough to be able to speak it. It is in your heart, so you know that you must do it. Hence, there is no 
excuse for not obeying all his biddings and enablings. And so, as I was reading this, I was thinking about how we need to be committing the Bible to memory because that way it is in our hearts. And if the time comes that we can't um, have our Bibles accessible, then we will have it in our memory. <clears throat> so, in fact, the Apostle Paul quotes some of these verses in context of salvation in Christ. That is, Paul refers to them and his example of righteousness by faith. So Romans 10, or 6 through 10 says, But the righteousness of faith in this way, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven or bring it down from above, who will descend from the abyss or bring it up from the dead. Does this sound like Moses? But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God was raised from the dead, then you shall be saved. For the heart of one, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So we see this both in the Old and the New Testament. It isn't too hard. Um, and I would like to close with, by, by reading to you from Selected Messages. The faith that is unto salvation is not a casual faith. It is not a mere consent of the intellect. It is a belief rooted in the heart that embraces Christ as a personal Savior, assured that he can save you to the uttermost, all that come unto God by him. To believe that he will save others but will not save you is not genuine faith. Have any of you thought that? Oh, God can save you, but I, I don't know. I, enough, I'm not good bad. enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think we've all had that, had that, um, that problem with our, our faith. But when the soul lays hold on Christ as the only hope of salvation, then genuine faith is manifested. The, this faith leads us, leads its possessor to a place, all the affections of the soul upon Christ. His understanding is under the control of the Holy Spirit. His character is molded after the divine likeness. His faith is not dead, but faith that works by love and leads him to behold the beauty of Christ and to become assimilated with the divine character. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and thine heart of seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. I also love that verse about how Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light compared to the baggage we carry around with our bad decisions. <laughs> yeah. Boy. So, Mark, can you tell us about Thursday, a question of worship? Oh, sounds good. So, you know, when I was listening to you all about, it kind of resonates with me. I think there's times where I would say that it's probably... I only know there's one God. I think this idea of choice must be easy. You had a good quote, you know, the $1,000 shopping spree or what, a thousand multiple, multiple gunshot, gunshot wounds. wounds. To me, that seems easy, right? right. <laughs> that seems easy. So why was God, why is God telling us this thing? Why in Deuteronomy, you know, he's talking about this stuff? It must have been tougher for the Israelites. And also it could have been <laughs> deception pride or arrogance or just flat out right. valuing something before God. Right, right. And I think it was difficult for the Israelites, and, and we'll talk about how it applies to us too, but I mean, they were surrounded, a small group just surrounded by pagan influence and pagan believers. Actually, I was listening to what Barbara said in that, you know, my house, I got, I only know one God. There's multiple Bibles around it. You know, why why should I worry about this today? Why is it, is it going to be hard for me to choose? And I think that's what we're going to talk a little bit about here in this lesson here. Um, in fact, um, we talk about the small ethnic group with no power. Let's go to Deuteronomy 7, verse, chapter 7, verse 7, which God talks about the children of Israel and how he chose them. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. Of all the nations around them, they, you know, they escaped from Egypt with Moses. 
Um, and of course, Egypt was the, the local superpower at the time. And they, they had gods, multiple gods. And they're going to be in the desert. And Moses is preparing them in Deuteronomy to go into the promised land. Well, this promised land was not empty. They were going to have to conquer seven nations or more. But at least seven is what they, we were told. And each one of them, and we're going to read in Deuteronomy how careful God wants them to be after he promises them the promised land, to give them the land. And let's read about this and see maybe how it applies to us. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you're going to possess and cast out all the nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites, if I say that right, and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy of them. You shall make, you shall make mar- you, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son or take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and bird their carved images in fire. And we kind of see this throughout Deuteronomy. You saw that there. He's super careful. Now, don't stray away from me. And throughout Deuteronomy, Moses is constantly telling them the same thing. In fact, very, very end, just after chapter 30, he says he has one more song. Uh, as, as chapter 30, Barbara was saying, it was, it was the last thing. He had a couple more things to say. He actually had a, long, a song there. And in that song, he talks about Deuteronomy 32, verses, verses 39, about the God, the one God. And it says, Now see that is, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I, will, I kill and I will make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there anyone who can deliver from my hand. So at the very end of Deuteronomy, he talks about it, but he actually says this all throughout Deuteronomy, the same warnings about, just like we said in chapter 7, about following the true God and not being, going somewhere else. Um, In Deuteronomy 4, verses 19, we're going to talk about shiny things and see, and let's read about these verses, but let's see how they apply to us and possibly our that things that can put a wedge between us and God. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 19. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all of the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, that the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. He's worried about, you're looking at these beautiful things, and you say, well, let me worship that. Is there something that you may be worshiping? Deuteronomy 8, uh, besides God, Deuteronomy 8, verses 19, and this one, Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. Are you too busy that you may forget your God? And you're, you're too busy with work. You're too busy caring for the kids, running around, that you forget to talk about God. Deuteronomy 11, Verses 16, and take heed, lest your heart be deceived, that you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Don't be deceived by promises. God has talked about this, and so all all Deuteronomy talks about it. The one other thing I want to point before we dig a little bit further um, and go on from this is that in addition to God giving these warnings, he also tells people that he's a jealous God. He wants us to love him. He does not want anyone else. He is there for us. Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6, verses 15. The Lord your God is a jealous God. Least the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. He says, you need to, you need to believe in me. Well, these are all warnings for the Israelites. How are they warnings for us today? Like the stars in heaven or the beauty of the earth? Is this love of beautiful things taking you away from serving your fellow man, bringing them to Christ? What about the need to be significant? Uh, how many page views we have on YouTube? Um, how many likes you get, thumbs up we get on Facebook and Instagram? Are gaze getting between you and God? 
The pull is great. I, I feel it every day. What about materialism and that need for the best new gadget? That $1,000 shopping spree sounds good, right? <laughs> well, what about drugs? Maybe even caffeine. Is it hurting your ability to focus on Jesus? What about this idea today about a political idea of being on the left or the right? Is that keeping you away from reaching across and comforting your brother, even though they may believe something different politically than you? These are things that divide us. These are things that possibly can be a wedge between you and the Lord. And I'm going to say that maybe it is hard it's not easy to figure out that choice. And I think Barbara and, and, and Byron have both been talking about that. Satan is the most powerful angel before his fall. He was. He's smart and resourceful and take any situation and will try to twist it so that there's a wedge between God and ourselves. This division between us and God makes him more powerful and is only going to be difficult moving forward. Well, in fact, in Revelations, we're going to look a little bit in Revelations and the, story, and the warnings that John gave us about the times we're living in now. Look around. You know, it's kind of like the end times. We're not going to read all about the... We're going to read first about Revelations 13, and we're going to talk about the beast. And I want to... Not the whole Revelations 13, but just a portion of it. And we're going to talk about the second beast coming. And the second beast, of course, was... The beast was, is, of course, Lucifer... And, and he is deception of us. I want to see what he says and what the beast asks us to do about worship. Revelations 13, chapters 11, uh, verses 11 and 12. Then I saw another beast, and this is the second beast, coming out of the earth, that he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those that dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs as if he makes fire come, from, come down from heaven on the earth in, in the sight of man, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he ha was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. This Antichrist is going to come, and he is going to he's going to work to deceive us and he's going to make signs that look just like something we read out of the Bible. You know, fire from heaven. How are we going to be able to figure that out? God talks about deceiving right here. And we read that also in Deuteronomy. And the beast is trying to act like God, except he's not. Look at 15. He says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and that image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And so the end times are going to be tough. There's going to be persecution. Just like the Israelites going into the promised land to take it over, the end times are going to be tough, and the devil's going to try his hardest to put a wedge between us and God. But the simple answer, and we're going to see that also in Revelation chapter 14, the three angels' message, is to follow God. And let's read about how God reacts to this image. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of the heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, and tongue, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who has made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. He says, follow. Isn't this what Moses has said in Deuteronomy? Fear God and give him glory. And of course, dig into that everlasting gospel and preach it to those around us. Second angel's message talks about, we're going to see another angel came down saying, Babylon has fallen, is fallen, that great city, because he has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of fornication. This is a time of confusion that's going to happen during the second angel's message. Babylon means confusion. The society is falling. Those things that the beast was saying were not going to come true. And the third angel's message talks really about the same thing that, G, uh, that uh, Moses said in, Daniel, in Deuteronomy. It says right here, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength, the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. 
follow God and live, follow something else and die. Just as the Israelites at the end, time of Moses, we have a choice to worship God and preach his gospel. But it's tough. it could be tough. It's going to be tougher. But I'm going to say, I'm going to finish this up. Daily prayer and weekly reflection and persistence and constant effort to get to know God better. Barbara mentioned this. Byron mentioned this. To understand his word more. These are what is going to get us through. Pastor Philip, an associate pastor of ours, our pastor Philip, uh, he's an associate pastor at Loma Linda. He had a revelation seminar and talked about that end decision, whether you choose God or not. And he says that, that end decision at the end of the time is really a culmination of daily, small, incremental, daily decision choices that you make every day. Every day we have many thousands of choices to make. And what God wants us to do is make that choice towards him, that persistent journey towards him, so we have a better ability. And when we do, when we do, and there is deception, and I see that, and we know the Lord, and we know the Bible and the Word, that we will have a better ability to understand the deceptions from, from Satan, to feel when things are not right. Amen. The plan of salvation is not hard. God makes it, it's not the king of the north or the king of the south or anything like that. It's very straightforward and it's very simple. And that is what we need to know. Because God will keep us straight in the end. Barbara, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I'd just like to say um, a couple of things. Um, think about Moses' speech to the children of Israel and going into the promised land and choosing him. We're living in an era now where right is wrong and wrong is right. Mm -hmm. Where there's a lot of coercion in choices that we're making. It may mean if you make a certain choice, you may not be able to keep your job. We're finding that it's getting more and more, um, more and more of the final events we're seeing starting to come to pass. And my desire for you and all of us is that you choose life. Amen. Thank you. So I would write, like to read something from Steps to Christ, chapter 5, <clears throat> pages 43 and 44. The government of God is not, as Satan would make it appear, founded upon a blind submission, an unreasoning control. It appeals to the intellect of the conscience. Come now, let us reason together, is the Creator's invitation to the beings He has made. Isaiah 118. God does not force the will of His creatures. And I think you've both said that very well. When you worship God, it's by choice. Amen. Satan forces worship. He cannot accept an homage that is not willingly and intelligently given. And that really would be love. You can't love unless you choose to. The, a mere forced submission would prevent all real development of mind and character. It would make man a mere automaton basically a robot. Such is not the purpose of the Creator. He desires that man, the crowning work of his creative power, shall reach the highest possible development. He sets before us the height of blessing to which he desires to bring us. Through his grace, he invites us to give ourselves to him. That is the choice that we make that we may work his will in us. It remains for us to choose whether we will be set free from the bondage of sin or death to share the, or to share the glorious liberty of the sons of God. In giving ourselves to God, we must necessarily give up all that would separate us from him. And we've all touched on that. Mm -hmm. Hence, the Savior says, whosoever... He be of you that forsaketh not all that he has. He cannot be my disciple. And that's Luke 14, 33. Whatever shall draw away the heart from God must be given up. Mammon is the idol of many. The love of money, the desire for wealth, is the golden chain that binds them to Satan. 
reputation and worldly honor are worshipped by another class, the life of selfish ease and freedom from the responsibility is the idol of others. But these slavish bands must be broken. We cannot be half the Lord's and half the world's. We are not God's children unless we are such entirely. I want to read that one more time. We are not God's children unless we are such entirely, unless we are all in, 100%. I encourage each and every person listening to this to surrender yourself to God through Jesus Christ that we may all be children of the living God. Not only in this world now, and the blessings are tremendous here, not by the world's standards necessarily, but that we might also for all eternity in New Jerusalem dwell with the living God forever. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Heavenly Father, our hope and our desire is to be you, with you, Lord, to be your sons and daughters, to, Lord, put aside all other things that distract us in this world. Satan is a master deceiver. And he will lead some away by pride. He will lead some away by just keeping them busy, Lord. And he will use any means possible, as Mark said, to put a wedge between us and you, Lord. So, Lord, we ask for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, to be transformed into the glory that is you. Even when Adam was created in the image of God, he reflected that glory. He has none himself. And Lord, we, as bright as we might think we are, we are nothing without you. We ask for guidance and wisdom. We ask and pray that everyone may spend time in your word daily, that we might not only know the character of the living God, but yearn anxiously, hopefully, and longingly to be with you, not only in this earth, Lord, but in heaven with our God and our Savior. And not just by ourselves that we might have the desire, Lord, that you have to save souls in a perishing world that we might not see just people we know, but people that have been transformed and changed by you as well. We thank you for your mercy and grace and the love you give us, Lord. Teach us to love you with all of our heart and soul in return. We pray this to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, our King and Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.